Hey, I'm so glad that you've decided to uh, worship with us this morning. And uh, to those joining online, uh, we just want to say welcome. Uh, we, uh, we're sad that you can't be here uh, for whatever reason, but uh, you're very much a part of our family, and we, we love you guys. So we are continuing in our series in the book of Genesis. So go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. And uh, some of you don't get to see my kids very often, so I figured as you're turning into your books to Genesis 2, uh, a couple pictures. We got some uh, digital prints from the school. There's Sam. Sam is in second grade. He's learning piano. That was the best of three pictures. They get better, okay? Uh, he's a lot of fun. This is Paisley. Uh, Paisley is in kindergarten, and she's uh, a lot of fun. fun. Um, and then it gets better. That is Essie. That legit is a school picture. Um, that is not Photoshopped. And uh, Essie's in preschool, and she is wild. And uh, it, the story goes this. We're coming home from church. I'm taking the kids home from church on, on a Wednesday night. And uh, I said, uh, Essie, your picture day is tomorrow. What do you want to wear? And she goes, I want to go naked. And I said, no, you cannot go naked to school. And then all the kids start chanting, naked, naked, naked. <laughs> And I was, I was like, what, this is just a, a circus. What, what life am I living right now? I said, well, what do you really uh, want to wear tomorrow? We need to think. Is there a particular outfit? And she's like, hmm, my hot dog costume. So I went, uh, I, I was like, well, we'll see. You know, I'll have to have a conversation with your mom. You know, when Elizabeth and I close our eyes and we picture an Essie age four, we don't think nice, well-done hair. We don't think pretty dress. We think hot dog costume. So we were fine with it. The teacher is fine with it. And this is a picture of my wife, for those who don't know my wife. And she, I think, deserves mother of the year for not uh, forcing our kids to, to wear things on picture days. I always hated that. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's busy. Life uh, with three kids is, is busy. And I'm sure that uh, as they get older, it's just going to get busier. There's going to be more activities, more lessons, more sports things. You know, just life just picks up. And uh, this last month, the last five weeks, we're almost done with October, but just moving into uh, the new building and moving offices and getting settled and making decisions, it's been busy. And I don't stand up here to uh, complain or uh, brag about how busy life has been, I actually stand up here to confess to you that uh, I haven't done the greatest job at creating time for rest in my life. And uh, this morning, we're gonna be uh, taking a look uh, and talking about the Sabbath. This was a timely message, I believe, for me personally. Um, I'm out of my sling. Some of you knew I was in a mountain biking accident, and I've been in a sling for seven weeks. I got that off on Thursday. I'm doing some range of motion therapy, and uh, it feels good to be out. Um, but uh, just learning what rest is from a biblical approach. And Pastor Brian and I worked on this together. We both learned way more than uh, we can present just today. So I'm actually going to be sharing another message tonight titled Rhythms of Rest, looking at how uh, we, we Sabbath. And so I would hope you come back um, at 6 p.m. tonight. So we're going to jump into Scripture, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord has just finished six days of creating, and would you stand with me uh, as we read the Word of God? We're about ready to read about the seventh day in the creation account. Genesis 2, starting in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to learn. Uh, there is so much that I feel you have to say about uh, the Sabbath, and I just pray that you would guide me and that you would open up our hearts and uh, allow those who have come in that uh, have burdens that need rest to find rest in you this morning. We look to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You can find your seats. So this morning, we're going to be answering three questions. What is the Sabbath? Why did God institute the Sabbath? And should Christians observe 
the Sabbath? All great questions, not enough time. What is the Sabbath? Let's get uh, start, started with that, and let's start with what the Sabbath is not, okay? The Sabbath is not a day just to sleep and catch up on sleep. However, that could be a part of the Sabbath is physical rest. The Sabbath is not laundry day. However, <laughs> I got you, Blake. Um, however, laundry could be a part of uh, your Sabbath. The Sabbath is not just an hour and 15 minute church service. However, church and assembling together and worshiping together could be a part of the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath is not a family lunch or a dinner or family nights on Sunday nights, but that certainly could be involved uh, with the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath this morning is a God-ordained, designated day of rest with the purpose of dwelling with him. And I hope you're taking notes this morning because uh, there's a lot of really good material in here, and this might be even one that you go back and listen to because I'm going I'm to stick with my notes this morning. The English word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. Everybody say Shabbat. Shabbat literally means to cease or to stop working, okay? God himself demonstrates this in the creation account by ceasing or stopping to create on the seventh day. There is, however, another word in Hebrew scriptures that's used for rest, and that word is nuach, N-U-A-K-H. Everybody say nuach, okay? This means to dwell or to settle or to rest and um, This is not the same as clocking out from an hourly job. This type of rest, new walking, is like sitting in front of a fire with a loved one or unpacking a suitcase to stay at grandma's house for the holidays. And scripture introduces these two concepts of Shabbat and Nuach about the same time in scripture. Okay, in the creation account, God works for six days creating the world and then he rests or he Shabbats on the seventh day. And after six days of bringing order to the chaos, he takes time to Shabbat from his work. Only a few verses later we read that God creates humans and then immediately rests them or settles them or nuocs them into the garden with him. So Genesis 2 verse 15. You can read this. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him, nuocs him, settles him, rests him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The literary structure communicates a link between Shabbat and Nuach. They are connected, and God leads by example as he rests or he Shabbats from his work, and then he dwells or he settles and he rests, he Nuachs with his people. Shabbat, hear me this morning, Shabbat is about stopping what you were doing, while Nuach is about settling into the place where you stopped so that you might be refreshed. Okay, now some of you might be a little confused at verse 15, what we just read, where it says that the Lord settles or he rests Adams in the garden, but then he does so with the intention of him to work it right? It seems contradictory, like I'm going to rest you here, I'm going to settle you here, but then you're going to work the garden. That that seems contradictory, um, but it's, it's not, and I'm going to do my best to unpack to you in the next few minutes of what it took me like 10 days of study and research uh, to understand. So take notes. We're going to go through this. You might have to visit it in um, the next coming days. Looking back at our text today in verse three, it says this, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now there's three things that uh, stand out to me in verse three that we're gonna look at, okay? The first is that God blesses the seventh day. He does what? He blessed the seventh day. He makes it holy. It's special. It's set apart. If God blesses your finances, it means that you'll have all you need. If God blesses your health, it means that he's going to sustain you and give what you need. When God blesses anything, it's God providing 
for us and for you. We as believers are called the blessed. Why are we blessed? Why are we called blessed? Because God has provided to us salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. God blesses the seventh day. The second thing in verse three is it says that on it, he rested from all the work of creating. He rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, I personally believe that there is a difference between working to create and working to maintain. There's a difference between working to create and working to maintain. Now, stick with me here. True or false? Scripture says that God rests on the seventh day, and the verdict is true. You guys didn't sound very confident in that, okay? True or false, on the seventh day, God blesses it and makes it holy. True. Wouldn't God blessing the seventh day be considered work? Wouldn't God making a day holy be considered work? I want you to imagine with me that that you are in the process of building a vacation home. And this vacation home is uh, um, on an island and it's fruitful and it's beautiful and it's just so perfect and blissful. And, and you're, you're building this home. Now, how many know that in building, it takes a lot of work? It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of mental strain. There's a lot of stress. Uh, it, it's going to take some sweat, some sweat equity. It's going to take um, uh, just making sense where it's like, man, I've got all these materials. How do they fit together? And it's a lot of hard work. And you're building this vacation home on, on this perfect place. And it's a lot of hard work. But then it's done. Okay? And it's complete. And you go there to take your first week of vacation at this home. Okay, you might have to go to the grocery store and get some groceries. And, and then you, you'd have to make some meals and, and maybe do some meal prepping. And then maybe a few days into it, you might have to do some laundry because you need some clothes for the second half of your vacation. That is a very different kind of work than building and creating the house in the first place. God, and stick with me, God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he did it so wonderfully and so perfectly that we were never meant to have to toil or strain to survive. God had given humanity all that it needed to live. Adam didn't have to till fields, plant seeds, prune vines, and work hard to provide for himself. Why? Because God had already provided for him. God created and he called it good. It wasn't until sin entered the world that man had to begin to work and to toil. We jump to chapter 3, verse 17, and it says that the Lord curses the ground, right? So in verse 15, uh, that, that we, we read about God putting Adam in the Garden of Eden to work the land and to tend it, right? In verse 15 where it says that God settles Adam to take care of the land and work it. Work for Adam would not have been tiring for two reasons. One, because God dwelt with him. He knew walked with him. And two, because God provided all that he needed. Adam and the land were working together where after the sin entered the world, Adam and the land were actually working against each other. There is a difference between working to create and working to maintain. And the third thing from verse three is that unlike all the other days of creation, the seventh day doesn't seem to have an end. Jump back to Genesis chapter one in, in your Bibles, verse five. It says, and it ends this way, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And verse eight, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. In verse 13, and there was evening and there was morning the third day, and so on and so forth. But when we get to day seven, the author doesn't end that way. Now, could this be a mistake? 
could it have been forgotten or could this be intentional to communicate that the rest that is found in the presence of God was meant to be eternal. It was meant to be ongoing. Could it mean that God intended for us to live with him in his presence and enjoy all that he had created and enjoy all that he had provided for us? I believe so. An eternal seventh day of rest. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. This is when Moses receives the Ten Commandments and God instructs the Israelites to observe the Sabbath. Exodus 20, starting in verse 8. This is him getting the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this text leads us to our second question as why did God institute the Sabbath, right? Why did God institute the Sabbath? And there are several reasons, uh, and we don't have time to get into all of them, but we're gonna get to a few of them. And the most important, the first is this, is that it redirects our attention to God and to the future promise of eternal rest. Why did God give us a Sabbath? Why did he instruct us to Sabbath? Because it redirects our attention to him and it points to the future promise of eternal rest. When sin entered the world, it brought with it the need to toil. It brought with it the need to work. And due to the labor that is now required to live, it causes our eyes to be taken off of Christ and be put uh, on the things that we are doing. And it's very easy to become distracted and preoccupied with making a living. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, whether it is work or it is leisure, it is very easy for us as humanity to take our eyes off of God, off of Christ, and begin to put them on ourselves and our surroundings. Okay, stopping what we are doing to dwell with God helps us refocus and recalibrate. But it doesn't just help us recalibrate and refocus our attention to God, it actually points back to what God originally attended and points forward to what will happen. A new heaven, a new earth where we are eternally with God, where we forever will be resting in the presence of God, where all things will be restored, a life of eternal rest with God our creator. From start to finish of the Bible, we see this theme of rest. God introduces it in Genesis chapter 2, and then in Revelation 14, verses 11 through 13, you can follow along on the screens, says this, this is John the Apostle having this revelation, there will be no, there will be no what? Rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I, John, John the Apostle, heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. How many of you are looking forward to eternal rest with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I, there's days where I wake up where I'm just like, whew, I really don't wanna do what I have to do today. I just look forward to being in the presence of God where all things are made new. We're gonna close this morning with the opportunity for those who have come in who are full of burden, who are tired, who have been burning the candle at both ends to meet with the presence, to nuoc, to dwell, to settle with Jesus Christ, the person of peace. And I'm gonna invite people to come forward to this altar and just rest in his presence. 
I look forward to that day, but I'm thankful that I don't have to wait till I kick the bucket to experience rest. I can have that right now through the presence of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. And that invitation is good for me as it is uh, good for you. And I would just encourage you, anyone who needs rest, to be willing to come and receive that. Recalibrate and refocus on God this morning. The second reason why God institutes the Sabbath is it's a way for us to demonstrate our trust in God. It's a way for us to demonstrate our trust in God. When the Israelites, who were God's chosen people, were wandering in the desert for 40 years, God provided for them a food called manna. And he instructed them to only take what they needed for that day. Why? Why did God instruct them only to just take what they needed for that day? Well, two reasons. One, because it taught them to trust that God would continue to provide, and also it made them recognize that all that they had was from God. It taught them to trust them that God would continue to provide for them, and it taught them that Everything that they had was, in fact, from God. In Leviticus chapter 25, it talks about the land and giving the land a Sabbath year where the Israelites weren't supposed to work the land for an entire year. Every seventh year, the Israelites were to not cultivate the land but just live off of what the land naturally uh, was able to provide. That would require a lot of trust. Sabbathing is similar to tithing. Okay, we see this, this theme. In tithing, we give God 10% to acknowledge that all that we have has been given to us from him and also to trust that what he has given to us is gonna be enough to provide for us and it will provide all of our needs. Maybe not all of our wants, but it's saying, God, I trust you, I acknowledge that this is from you, but I also trust and believe that you are providing for me and you have given me what I need. Let me ask you this. Do you trust God that if you are to Shabbat and Nuach with him, that he will help you accomplish everything that you need to accomplish for today, for this week, for this season, for this month? Do you trust God enough to say, God, I am going to give you my time And I am going to put you first. I am going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to Shabbat. And I am going to rest with you. I am going to settle with you. I am going to nuach, to dwell with you. And I trust that as I do that, neglecting other things that need to be done, I trust that you are the Lord that will provide for me. Some people get really bent out of of shape about um, tithing. You know, and it's like the Lord uh, saying, man, man, 10%'s a lot. What if he asked for 14.25%? You know, set one and seven, you know, instead of one and 10. Time is very valuable, but the Lord is faithful. And when we rest and we dwell with the Lord, he will provide. It's, it's an element of trust. Another reason is so that we can be more fruitful, okay? It, Isn't it interesting how the world is always trying to catch up with the ways of God and the wisdom of God? It wasn't just until recently where companies are starting to see the value in adopting policies of take what you need for vacation, right? I believe, was it Wells Fargo or is it Principal? Here, they, they got rid of their vacations and they just say, take what you need, Isn't it interesting that it's just now in culture that uh, paternal leave where dad's being able to take time off and realizing the importance of rest and that time with the children, that that is is something that is valued and and seen as valuable and and fruitful. You know, we even have the government uh, trying to catch up to what God says is good. We've got government programs that pay farmers to put their land in a season of rest through CRP because they know why, that the land benefits from having rest. The world is constantly trying to catch up with what God has said is good from the very beginning, to rest, to dwell, 
Rest leads to being more fruitful and more productive. Dr. Wave Nunley shared a story that was first told to us by St. John Cassian. Okay, St. John Cassian. And this guy is a spiritual descendant of the Apostle John. He is related to the Apostle John, and he tells this story. Okay, you guys know the Apostle John. He wrote the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. The Apostle John that studied under Jesus Christ and his teachings. This is a, a relative downstream, spiritually downstream, John Cassian. And he tells this story um, about the Apostle John. He says this, One day John was sitting in the city gate, possibly Ephesus, and he saw a hunter coming in from the field. The hunter had his bow unstrung, carried over his shoulder. The hunter got to the city gate and said to the apostle John, are you that aged John of whom I've heard so much of in my lifetime? John replied, yes, I'm that same John. The hunter said, Why is it that you are wasting so much time stroking that partridge you have in your lap? The Apostle John asked, What is that you have strapped over your shoulder? The hunter said, This is my bow, and I'm dependent on it for my livelihood. John said, Why does it remain unstrung? The hunter said, It's simple. If I left my bow tightly strung all the time, their limbs would lose their elasticity. And when it comes time for me to loose an arrow and take down a beast and provide for my family, my bow would have lost its strength and it wouldn't deliver the blow appropriately. John said, So it is with this partridge. You see, if my life is spent in nothing but toil and labor and difficulty, how would I be able to obey the power of the Spirit when called upon? If all we do is work, then how will we be effective for the kingdom of God? How mothers, fathers, Parents, how can we effectively raise our children in the spirit of grace if we are constantly at end's wit because we are burning the candle too much at both ends? We aren't rested. We're exhausted. How can I pastor this church if I never take time and I don't stop, I don't Shabbat and Nuach with the God of creation? where he begins to dwell inside me and he empowers me. There is more fruit that will happen and take place in your life as you begin to rest with our creator. Zechariah 4, 6 said this in regards to building the temple. It's not gonna be by might. It's not going to be by power. You're not going to build this by might or power. It's going to be by my spirit. Church, we need to be a people full of his spirit. There can be so much fruit coming out of your life as you, as you Sabbath. For your family, for your work, for your church, in the community. You will be more fruitful for the kingdom of God as you rest. And the last reason why God institutes the Sabbath, last reason that I'm going to give this morning, is that God loves to spend time with his creation. That's you and me. In case you didn't know, in case you have forgotten, the God of creation who spoke things into existence, that has all the power and authority in heaven and in earth, and he rules over the world and he sees everything and he knows everything about you. He sees all your imperfections. He sees your struggles. He sees your weaknesses. He sees your past. Yet he loves you and he wants to spend time with you. There is nothing in this world that can substitute for spending time with God. There is no greater feeling. There is no deeper love. There is nothing sweeter than being with Jesus. And in just a moment, we are going to invite anyone who needs rest and wants to spend time with Jesus to come to these altars, to experience the person of rest. 
Well, this leads us to our last question. Should Christians observe the Sabbath? Should Christians observe the Sabbath? This is an Old Testament law. This is a ritualistic law. This is, this is something in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. Should Christians observe the Sabbath? The, the short answer to that is yes. And tonight I'm going to be talking about how to observe the Sabbath and what that looks for us as Christians tonight. And I hope that you'll come back. I really do because like I said, I could have probably preached four sermons. You guys are getting a very condensed little nugget of, of what I've learned. But I want to ask this question to you. Let's not ask should Christians observe the Sabbath. But I think the better question is why would you not want to observe the Sabbath? Why would we not want to spend time with our Creator? Failing to observe the Sabbath is failing to live life in the way that God sees as best. That's the truth. This is where we're going to end. The Sabbath is not a commandment that we are bound to. It's a promise that we are invited to enjoy. It's beautiful. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11. Oh, Jesus. He says this. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The most beautiful invitation that anyone could give. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the person of rest and of peace. And that invitation back there written in scripture is the same invitation that we have this morning. Come to him, new hope. Come to him, all who are weary and burdened, and he will. It's a promise. It's a promise to be enjoyed. It is not a command that we are bound to. It is a promise to be enjoyed, and he will give you rest. Would you stand with me and close your eyes? Maybe you've never experienced peace or rest with Jesus because you've never asked him to be Lord of your life. You've never repented of your sins, turned from your ways, and you know right now that you are not right with God. Maybe your soul has never found rest because you've searched for different ways to make peace with God, and you've searched in different religions, and you've explored them all, but there's never been that moment of peace and rest because you have never made peace and rest. You have never nuoked with God, Yahweh, our creator. And this morning you say, Austin, I want to ask Jesus to be Lord of my life. This, this person of peace, this person who can bring peace about me and God, who can forgive my sins, who can change my mind and change my heart, change who I am and how I feel and my desires. I want to ask him to be Lord of my life this morning with every eye closed and head bowed out of respect for your neighbor. Is there anyone here that would raise their hand and look me in the eye and say, I'm inviting the person, Jesus Christ, to be Lord of my life. Would you just raise your hand? Is there anyone here? Yes. Is there anyone? As you come to him. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your, your power and your presence. If you raise your hand, would you just repeat this in your heart after me? Lord, save me. Come into my heart, come into my mind, come into my life and do whatever you want to do. I ask that you'd forgive me of my past sins, but you'd set my feet on a path that is righteous, a path that is holy, a path that would honor you. Forgive me and save me in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I believe there are many here who are living a life that's exhausted, rarely stopping in this morning. You came in, whether you realize it or not, needing rest. Would you just raise your hand if that's you and just say, I need rest. I need Shabbat and Nuach with the Lord, with the Creator this morning. 
Yes, in just a moment, those that have your hands up, I'm going to invite you to come and meet with the person of peace. And lastly, how many would raise your hand and say, this morning I realized I need to do a better job of keeping the Sabbath. I commit to committing to church, spending time in the Word, spending time in worship, spending time in prayer, and making prayer a priority. I run too hard, I run too long, and I need some Shabbat and Nuach in my life. And you say, I'm just going to commit this morning. I'm going to commit to being a person of the Sabbath. Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. Yes. As I pray, would those who have responded just come to the altar? We're going to have some time to worship. We're not in a hurry. Listen, Sunday school can wait for a minute. Sunday school can wait. It's important. I hope you go. But we're here to rest, to stop, to be. If you're a teacher here and you feel the need to go to work, can I just challenge you just to rest? Would you come as I pray? Heavenly Father, as people step out of their seats right now, I pray that as they walk down, it'd be like walking into the aroma of the, the Holy of Holies, that they would walk into a spirit, into a cloud, into the presence of rest. And I pray that from the heavens, God, you would pour down your spirit, that people who feel burdened, people who feel just completely weary in their soul, that they would experience rest in a way that they have never experienced rest before. God, we love you. We turn our attention to you. We direct our minds to you. And we're thankful that in the beginning, when all things were perfect, that you created a space for us to rest. But even more so than that, as we toil, as we work, as we strain, we look forward to that day where we will forever be in your rest. We will forever be in your presence where all things are made new, where all things become undone in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So would you meet with us in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.